camera? It takes a little while. <laughs> Calling to order the Monday, January 22nd, 2018, regular meeting of the 37th Council of the City of Berkeley. Ms. Boucher, please call the roll. Mayor Pro Tem Baker? Here. Councilmember Blanchard? Here. Councilmember Gavin? Here. Councilmember Hennan? Here. Councilmember Cadeckle? Here. Councilmember Stedman? Here. And Mayor Turbra? Here. Um, first order of business is approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve tonight's agenda? Move to approve. Support. Move to approve by Councilmember Cadeckle with support from Councilmember Blanchard. Any additions or corrections? Seeing none, Ms. Boucher, would you please call the roll? Blanchard? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Hennan? Yes. Cadeckle? Yes. Stedman? Yes. Baker? Yes. Turbrat? Yes. Uh, at this time, please stand for the invocation with us today. We have Pastor Adam Groh. And please remain standing after the invocation for the pledge. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for this evening. Thank you for this council and these citizens who have gathered. We ask your blessing on this meeting. Lord, we pray that you would give uh, insight and discernment to the council, give them uh, wisdom in these decisions. May we all be uh, civil in our conversation, be compassionate, be respectful in all that we do. We thank you for this great city you've given us. I ask your blessing on our public safety, on your seniors, and all of our, our great city here. We ask your blessing on this meeting now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We've now come to the citizens' comments portion of tonight's meeting. You may present your thoughts on issues that are not included on tonight's agenda. Council members will not engage you in discussion. If your concern does need to be addressed by a member of city staff um, or department of the city, please sign your name on the sheet provided at the clerk's table. You can speak on a specific agenda item when it is being considered and when you've come up to the microphone, uh, please state your name and city of residence. Charles Terrell, a resident of Berkeley. Uh, in the last week or so, I wrote to the whole of the council uh, with concerns as to the operations of the Planning Commission. Uh, I was uh, put off on that. Uh, basically, I was tasked with finding a purple squirrel of times uh, where the courts have uh, where the courts have changed a, a local decision due to not following the rules. I'll ask you for a, a black swan. Find me times when the courts have, oh, have allowed a decision uh, even though the rules were not followed. Uh, any rules that are adopted by an organization, a council, a commission, whatever, uh, those rules then have the force of law if they're Roberts Rules of Order, bylaws, whatever they are. Uh, the Planning Commission bylaws are a positive, inclusive statement of what and how they are going to conduct their business. Uh, so special meetings are not included in there, and while they may be allowed by law, they are not allowed by, uh, by the Commission's own bylaws. Uh, the concept of that which is not prohibited is allowed that comes from English common law. It's really not applicable here. That's really more for the people rather than for governments. Uh, so therefore, during, during the uh, Planning Commission meeting, the chair stated that the special meeting was held to accommodate an applicant. But part of the uh, Berkeley ethics uh, codes say that uh, there are that there's no uh, preferential treatment to get, be given to any organization or person. 
So by having a special meeting to accommodate an organization or person, they <coughs> violated the ethics of, of Berkeley Code, the Berkeley Code of Ethics. So then I ask, uh, who makes those decisions on scheduling meetings? Who's on the hook for the, eth the ethical breach? Is that something that's the responsibility of the chair of the commission? Is that something that comes from city administration? Where does that come from? I really do believe you need an ethics investigation as to having that uh, special meeting on January 9th. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Seeing no other citizens coming to the microphone, we will move on from citizens' comments and move on to um, tonight's consent agenda. Ms. Boucher, would you please read the items on tonight's consent agenda? Approve the minutes, a matter of approving the minutes of the 37th City Council meeting on Monday, December 18, 2017, and the special meeting on Wednesday, January 3rd, 2018. Warrant, matter of approving warrant number 1322, resolution number R0118, matter of recognizing Becky Bone, owner of Nip and Tuck Diner, and resolution number R0218, matter of recognizing Ruth Hanley, owner of Sila Italian Dining and Pizza. Is there a motion to approve tonight's consent agenda? Motion to approve. Support. Mo moved by Mayor Pro Tem with support from Council Member Hannon. Ms. Boucher, would you please call the roll on tonight's consent agenda? Gavin? Yes. Hennon? Yes. Tadako? Yes. Sedman? Yes. <coughs> Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. And Turbrack? Yes. Would you please read item number one on tonight's regular agenda? Recognitions presentations, matter of any recognitions or presentations from the consent agenda. Thank you. I have asked uh, myself to read <laughs> resolution <laughs> R0118. Um, Becky, where are you hiding? Wouldn't mind coming up to the microphone. A resolution of the Council of the City of Berkeley, Michigan, recognizing Becky Bone, <coughs> owner of Nip and Tuck Diner. Whereas, Becky will not miss the 418 alarm clock. <laughs> she will miss all the people, the friendships, and the generations of residents that made Nip and Tuck a part of their daily routine. And whereas Bob Arthur bought the Royal Castle in 1972 and renamed the restaurant Nip and Tuck, where it would become a fixture of Berkeley for the next 45 years. Bob faithfully operated the restaurant until January of 2003 when he turned daily operations over to his daughter Becky. And whereas Bob's life revolved around the restaurant until he became sick in September of 2003. Bob passed on New Year's Eve of 2003. While Nip and Tuck was closed, so even in passing, he didn't disrupt the business or leave any potential tax implications for the new year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my dad, that's, that's all there. And whereas Becky's Nip and Tuck continued in her father's tradition as a place for a milkshake, Tom Watson, <laughs> or for high schoolers to visit during lunch and even sometimes during seminar. <laughs> and whereas Becky's Detroit Tigers fandom was obvious to anybody that entered the restaurant, capped off with a special appearance from the Detroit Tigers mascot Paws on her last day operating the restaurant. And whereas Becky and Nip and Tuck will be missed by many, so much so that Sergeant Justin Frost tried one last ditch effort to keep her there by handcuffing her to the bar on her <laughs> last day. <laughs> now therefore, the City of Berkeley resolves, Section 1, that City Council, on behalf of all residents, friends, families, and public safety officers, <laughs> hereby recognize and thank Becky Bone and her family, her father, Bob Arthur, mother, Judy Arthur, sister, Barb Lubick, brother, Eric, and her sons, Kyle and Ryan, for 45 years of owning and operating Nip and Tuck Restaurant and being an integral part of the fabric of Berkeley. Introduced and passed at a regular city council meeting on Monday, January 22nd, 2018, Daniel J. Turbrack, Mayor. Can I come up here, Becky? Oh. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Sure. Well, there, there you go. <laughs> um, I'm at a loss for words. That was awesome, Dan. I, I can't say thank you enough for to, to everybody, to the, the city. It's been awesome t for many, many years. And I just want to say thank you very much. Well, you're certainly welcome. And I know I speak for many here. Um, we will certainly miss Nip and Tuck. Uh, you and, and CELOs, of course, are two institutions that we are certainly going to miss. Um, but we're very lucky to have had you guys both here for as Thank long as you. we did. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Any other sure. Becky, I, I want to thank you for those breakfasts that got me going in the morning, <laughs> the, uh, the hot turkey sandwiches. There was one time where I went and I had my hot turkey sandwich and I had the corn and everything and all the sides and I went home and something like just wasn't right and Becky reminded me the next week that she forgot to give me the stuffing because she was out of it. <laughs> so she gave me a double helping the next time and, and those egg salad sandwiches you will be missed and I enjoyed talking baseball with you all these years. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have asked Councilmember Blanchard to read Resolution R0218. Thank you, Your Honor. A resolution the Council of uh, City of Berkeley, Michigan, recognizing Ruth Henley, owner of Silla's Italian Dining and, and Pizza. Whereas small businesses are the backbone of every community, they are an economic engine for Berkeley's local and regional economy. Small businesses contribute to the community building and development, and whereas Silla's Italian Dining and Pizza opened their doors in 1959 and served up Italian-American classics for more than 50 years. Under the ownership of Ruth Henley, Silla's Italian Dining and Pizza was known as a local favorite. And whereas located at 403312 Mile Road in our downtown development authority district, this full-service restaurant has held numerous gatherings for families, businesses, and civic organizations. They have hosted important life events such as weddings, baby showers, graduations, retirements, and funeral luncheons. And whereas over the years, Mrs. Henley has given back to the neighborhood through food donations to local churches, food banks, and the Jetson Center in Royal Oak, Silas Italian Dining and Pizza is a great representative of the caring and wonderful spirit that is the city of Berkeley. Now, therefore, the city of Berkeley resolves section one, the city council on behalf of all local residents, friends, and family hereby recognizes and thanks Ruth Henley for her many years of owning and operating Silas Italian Dining and Restaurant and for the contributing to the community introduced and passed at a regular city council meeting on Monday, January 22nd, 2018, Dan Turbrick, Mayor. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> You're not ready. Thank you. You gotta come here. You gotta come here. You gotta do the whole thing. Thanks for everything you've done for the city. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, before you say a few words, of one, 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 you're not getting off the hook that easily. Yeah, just, just wait, uh, Councilmember yeah. Kadeko. Ruth, uh, uh, I'd like to say uh, on behalf of the Dad's Club, who you've been so supportive to for so many years, uh, we have had many of our meetings there. In fact, we had a meeting there, our farewell meeting, and unfortunately, you weren't there. <laughs> and uh, on behalf of Dad's Club, and we have President Mike Kirby here tonight, um, here is a plaque that says, presented to Ruth Henley, Henley in appreciation of your support and generous contributions throughout the many years, December 2017. And this is a plaque for you from the Dad's Club. And so uh, I want to thank you for all of okay. that. <laughs> and 
now you can speak. Then I'll speak. <laughs> <laughs> what do I? What do I need to say? I don't know. <laughs> Come on. Whatever's I, in your heart right now. I, I miss Berkeley. I miss everyone. But I am so enjoying not getting up. Like <laughs> you said, it, it is so nice to be able to relax and actually have a life outside of a restaurant. So I love Berkeley. But you know, what, what can I say? <laughs> Thank you all. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I want to continue and thank you for participating in the Taste of Berkeley that helped many kids go to camp because of people like you with your contribution. I've been going to Sila since I was a kid, probably before he was born. Um, and I'll tell you, <laughs> yeah, definitely before he was born. But it, it, uh, it, it is definitely, you're definitely going to be missed. If you said you're going to miss me, we're going to miss you. And here's your plaque. <laughs> Both um, historic Berkeley businesses will truly be missed, but certainly not forgotten. And to ensure that is the case, I see him standing over there right now. Both businesses have donated uh, some very special items to our historical museum, uh, which is free to the public, open most Wednesdays from 10 to 1 and most Sundays from 2 to 4. So you're definitely going to want to uh, stop and check out uh, what both the business have donated to the Historical Museum. Certainly, um, we'll keep their legacy going in the city of Berkeley. So thank you both again, and congratulations. Thank you. Okay. I guess we'll move on to uh, item number two. Oath of Office. Oath of Office to newly appointed Council Member Ross Gavin. All right, let's give one quick second, and then we'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, yes, like you really want to get out. Uh, that's for over with. everybody. <laughs> yeah. Got some prime seating opening up in the front. <laughs> prime seating locations. You can stay if you want to. Front line. Whichever <laughs> 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 one you want. Do hereby solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. Do hereby solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of Michigan. The Constitution of the State of Michigan. The Charter and Ordinances of the City of Berkeley. The Charter and Ordinances of the City of Berkeley. And I will perform the duties of my office to the best of my ability. And I will perform the duties of my office to the best of my ability. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Welcome. Now he's got to get to work. <laughs> Thanks, <Jack>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cut a mace lock. Congratulations, Council Member Gavin. Thank you. Ms. Boucher, would you please read item number three? Motion number M0218, matter of approving appointments to various boards and commissions. Is there a motion to approve M0218? Move to approve. Support. Moved by Council Member Cadeco with support from Mayor Pro Tem. Baker. Mr. Baumgarten. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we have two appointments for you this, I'm sorry, three appointments for you today. Um, our acting finance director, uh, John Pepperman, would be appropriately appointed to the Public Safety Pension Board. Uh, and then we also have a, an opening, it's a five member board, two comes from the, uh, are supplied for the department, two are supplied by the local governing body. Uh, so Mark, and I'm going to get this wrong, and I apologize to Mark if he's here, but um, may see any of you. Um, okay. 
uh, would be the suggested appointment to fill the um, local governing body appointment position. Uh, the second one is for, or the third one's for the Zoning Board of Appeals. Mr. Miles Euler has been our longest serving alternate. Uh, he has agreed to step on to that board uh, following the departure of, or the resignation of one of their permanent members. So um, just a couple of quick updates for the City Council. Discussion from Council on the three appointees. Yes. Council Member Hennon. So I have no objection to any of the uh, appointments. Uh, my concern is a little bit with the process, you know, except for the Planning Commission, you know, it's City Council's decision on who to name. And the name showed up on the agenda, you know, without any consultation. So I'd like when we look at the process for filling city council vacancies, we also look at the process that we uh, make these appointments. And then one other small detail, I know the Public Safety Pension Board wasn't listed on the website, so I know some people aren't even aware that that's a thing that they could apply for. Okay. Any other discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Boucher, would you please call the roll? Hennon? Yes. Cadeckle? Yes. Stedman? Yes. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Gavin? Yes. And Turbrack? Yes. M0218 uh, has been approved. Ms. Boucher, would you please read item number four on tonight's agenda? Resolution number R0318, matter of authorizing the execution of the public unit master signature authorization agreement between the City of Berkeley and Flagstar Bank to provide the necessary authorizations for deposits, withdrawals, and other basic bank business on behalf of the City of Berkeley. Is there a motion to approve R0318? Motion to approve. Moved by Council Member Stedman. Support. Support by Council Member Hannon. <coughs> Mr. Baumgart. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, again, this is, reflects the Acting Finance Director, John Pepperman, uh, being in his position. Do we try to keep this current with Flagstar Bank so that our, whomever our, uh, is serving as a finance director is able to perform the functions of, of that job? Um, I will put a quick plug in that uh, while John is our acting finance director, uh, we do continue to search for uh, the next permanent uh, individual to fill that position. So that is out there. Information is available for that on the website as well as the um, professional organization for local government finance officers, as well as the Michigan Municipal League. So it's a quick plug. Uh, discussion from members of council. <coughs> Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Honor. And uh, just again, this is a normal operating business just to ensure that we have the right folks in the position so that Flagstar can honor the signatures and things like that. This is yeah. just normally what happens is we keep these roles filled and that kind of Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. And you'll see this again when we fill the position permanently. Great. Thank you. Other comments? Seeing none, uh, Ms. Boucher, would you please call the roll on item number four? Cadeckle? Yes. Stedman? Yes. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Hennon? Yes. And Turbrack? Yes. Ms. Boucher, would you please read item number five on tonight's agenda? Motion number M0318, matter of appointing Mayor Dan Turbrack as Berkeley's delegate and City Manager Matthew Baumgarten as the city's alternate delegate to the Southeast Michigan Council of Governments, SIMCOG General Assembly, and to instruct the city clerk to send a copy of this motion to SIMCOG membership services. Is there a motion to approve M0318? Motion approved. Support. Moved by Council or Mayor Pro Tem Baker with support from Council Member Blanchard. Mr. Baumgarten. Mr. Mayor, this, uh, this also reflects our past precedent of having the mayor serve as the <coughs> primary representative to the Southeast Michigan Council of Governments and the city manager serving as the alternate to that same body. Um, for those that are unaware, the Southeast, Southeast Michigan Council of Governments, uh, referred to as SEMCOG, is a, absolutely a regional body covering, I think, four or, or no, up to s uh, seven different uh, seven counties. counties. Yeah, um, Just does amazing work. They are the go-to for... Uh, for a lot of the data that we utilize to make decisions on public policy, as well as they represent a very strong voice um, really in, in Lansing and, and throughout the country on how governments can work together and really accomplish wonderful things. So I'm excited to have you, Mr. Mayor, as our representative to that body. Thank you. Is there any additional discussion, comments about SEMCOG, the role they play? 
Okay, we're really doing well. <laughs> uh, Ms. Boucher, would you please call the roll? Sedman? Yes. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Hennon? Yes. Beckel? Yes. And Turbrand? Yes. Would you please read item number six on tonight's agenda? Motion number M0418, matter of approving Mayor Dan Turbrack and Mayor Pro Tem Steve Baker as Berkeley's representatives to the Woodward Avenue Action Association. Is there a motion to approve M0418? Motion to approve. Support. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moved by Council Member Cadeco and supported by Council Member Stedman. Mr. Baumgarten. Uh, this is again another, no, more, another uh, great regional partner. Uh, the Woodward, Action Associ Woodward Avenue Action Association um, is exactly what it sounds like. They make, uh, there are several different local governments uh, represented by this body, and they've been one of the driving forces for the improvements, both aesthetic as well as how we use uh, Woodward um, going back many, many years. Uh, the formerly, our, our mayor has always sat on that, uh, uh, Mayor Dwyer before Mayor Turbrack. Uh, very excited, and they are very excited actually to have Steve. Uh, uh, representing the city of Berkeley as well. Um, I know, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, your, your roots go way back with this body, and you've been um, a great partner with them, and they're just over the moon to have you join them. So, okay, thank you. You accept? I do indeed. <laughs> <laughs> 11 communities and 27 miles of awesome right there. So, there you go. <laughs> should, be their, should be their tagline. <laughs> <laughs> 27 miles of awesome. Any other discussion? Anybody disagree? Okay, Ms. Boucher, would you please call the roll on M0418. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Hennon? Yes. Cadeco? Yes. Stedman? Yes. And Turbrack? Yes. M0418 has been approved. Ms. Boucher, would you please read item number seven? Discussion matter, dis matter of discussing possible ballot proposals to address facility and infrastructure needs within the community. Uh, is there a motion to move into a discussion? If I need that. Motion to move. So, sure. Okay, sure. motion by Councilmember Hennon. I'll support, support that one. Got <laughs> 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 it a little quicker on the buzzer there. Yeah, that's yeah, right. We gotta learn. Uh, support by Councilmember Gavin. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Baumgarten. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, to sort of go back um, quite a ways, we have been discussing. Uh, at several different iterations over the, the last many, many years, um, the need to address both our infrastructure and our city facilities. Uh, I'm excited that many of the plans set in motion by this body are, are beginning to come to fruition, uh, not only for this, the buildings themselves, but also um, tangible ways for addressing uh, a sustainable funding model for our infrastructure, which we're certainly not the only community to, to wrestle with this issue, but um, I like to think that we're going to do it better than anyone else, of course. Put forth in front of, uh, in front of this body and the, this community as a whole is exactly how do we get there. Um, what we've been discussing at the staff level as well as uh, with several of the subcommittees that um, take an interest in, in this topic, um, we are looking at a millage of 2.0 mills uh, dedicated specifically to infrastructure improvements. Uh, we are proposing that a um, bond be utilized to rebuild the community center. Uh, we actually were able to give a little bit of a preview of the concept that we're moving towards um, just last week actually. It was, I think, very well received and, and very well done by staff and those that participated and we got great constructive feedback from those that attended it. Um, and we covered city, a city hall renovation as well. As we know, this building has very specific um, issues that need to be addressed, not only on um, you know, size of this room sometimes, but uh, the energy efficiency, the, the fact that water doesn't stay outside of it as it uh, reasonably should, and then the uh, HVAC issues as well. So all three of these um, could be addressed by ballot-driven initiatives, um, which could go uh, on the ballot this year, depending on what this body would like to do. Your options are a special meeting in May, a uh, primary in August, and a general election in November. Um, there are, as we discussed at the open house, you know, there you can consider there to be pros and cons to each. Uh, and so uh, staff has supplied 
council with uh, with information. We we've got um, more for you still, even if if it needs to be. But looking for um, you know uh, some direction to staff as far as how do we how do we address this. And sort of hopefully that sets the picture, sir. So we have, <coughs> as the agenda item calls for us, is the discussion, uh, just a discussion at this point, um, to try to ascertain where council members uh, feel on each of the agenda items and if they are um, inclined to go to the voters, then we would have to discuss when the right time to go for voters might be. So there are a couple, couple of things that I want to um, discuss as well as with the residents that are here today. Um, thoughts on the items and whether you were comfortable moving forward uh, with a ballot initiative and when the right time uh, for those ballot initiatives may be. And if you had that, um, Mr. Manager, you would have enough input and direction on which way we need to go next, what yes, the next sir. steps would be? Absolutely, sir. Thank you. Okay. With that being said, kind of have the parameters of, of what we want to um, discuss tonight, who uh, was inclined to lead things off. I have a question. Sure. Um, I think this is a question for you, Mr. Baumgarten. Um, so I think we're ready to ask for roads, but sewer and stormwater, uh, we still have studies going on. You know, if we were considering May, <coughs> what's going to be, what are we going to be doing? What's going to be in place? Mm -hmm. Do we even know that yet? Uh, yes, thank you, Ms. Shannon. Um, so we are in the midst uh, of a study right now that uh, was spurred following the August 28th um, flood event uh, in which we were studying the capacity of our system as well as how do we address what we know will be more frequent and more intense storms moving forward. Uh, we refer to that as our climate change resiliency report. Um, we will be taking those recommendations and incorporating it into future projects. So if we have a road project, if we have a water main project, uh, as soon as the, if the ground is open, we'll, uh, we'll take those recommendations and see what's appropriate to incorporate into such a project um, that will utilize um, probably installation of new capacity. Uh, it could ins uh, also mean some of the best management practices that have been um, produced by, I would say, many different organizations that are out there. Um, you know, SEMCOG being one of them, actually, as we mentioned at the previous meeting. But we anticipate the full completion of that study in April. Um, the first project that we would be able to um, move along with under uh, a new funding strategy would probably not take place until 2019. Um, that would allow the funds to you know, basically be paid out, um, banked, and then we'd be able to develop a project based on that new funding structure. So those would incorporate those studies, but we wouldn't, we, we may not have the opportunity to talk specifics uh, about the recommendations themselves before um, the middle of August but uh, we know that they would be part of any project moving forward, if that answers the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hennon. Since we're talking about the roads, let's, let's all just stick with that one uh, mm -hmm. right now and try to talk about these one at a time. Um, who else would like to uh, comments or questions? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I met with uh, <coughs> Public Safety, or DPW Director, excuse me, uh, Derek Schuler this afternoon and just to give you guys some education, as well as I was learning uh, what this road millage is all about. The road funding comes from the State Act 51, which is our shared revenue. And as we're all aware, our shared revenue has been declining for a long time. So Act 51 will not support the road reconstruction projects on a regular basis. The road millage will allow us to do one project every year or two years, depending on the conditions. About, there are about a half a dozen to dozen roads equivalent to the Harvard project that was just completed that need to be done. So, and that took about eight months to build, and you're talking about a half mile stretch. 
the water and sewer, they come from the same account, the money from, the, from our water bills. And that is only for water main pipe replacement. That's where that money comes from. Um, and that's where you saw the increase in the water bill and that's helping to, to keep that going. The road millage would allow us to do both on a regular interval. Uh, and then as you spoke about the sewer, we're gonna have the report in April. Um, and, and there's a big question, that, that's a risk because we don't know, uh, as, as Derek said, how big of a pipe do we need for, for, the, for the rainwater or whatever. And you know what? No one knows that answer. Uh, to, you know, the, we don't know because the rain patterns are changing all the time. So we're, we're in, the, in the dark with that one. Um, and, and, and just an example where it happened in Windsor just this past 2017, they spent millions of dollars in, into their sewer work and they taxed their residents, and they still got hit really bad by the 2017, worse than we did by the 2017 thing. So you can see the need for, for the roads. And uh, I mean, I see the need, me personally, I see the needs now. But I just wanted to give the residents and our neighbors an idea of what this is all gonna entail uh, if we do pass this road millage. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mayor. Yeah. If I may. Uh, I'm glad you brought the Harvard Road Project because it really does set the context uh, of what the possibility is for this type of, of road. Uh, I know it sounds like a long time to do, you know, to do a half mile, eight months sounds like a long time to do a half mile stretch. Uh, it's worth noting that was a complete water main replacement. Uh, we actually completely removed the road bed itself uh, and rebuilt it, added, I think, eight inches of new aggregate to make sure the road bed itself is stronger less uh, less subject to frost heavals and and all the different uh, you know uh, uses that a road that take place on a road uh, and then also it was sidewalk to sidewalk we were able to replace those sidewalks completely and then resurface the road and uh, it was a complete reconstruction with water main uh, as well so um, that is the kind of example that we would like to emulate uh, in a sustainable program I can say there, there we have more than 50 50 miles of road in the city, uh, even at a half a mile a year, it would be more than 10 years. We're, we're committing to uh, a very long cycle of replacing those roads, and, and if we do it well, by the time that um, you're ending your one cycle, you're, you're in a good spot to start another one. So infrastructure needs to be a sustainable, um, a sustained project that uh, really never stops. So I, I appreciate the, you bringing that up. Thank you, Mr. Member. Uh, so just to talk a little bit more just about that specifically so the two mills the 10 years um, what is the expectation on an annual basis of roads that we would able to actually address uh, we would we were targeting half a mile of road uh, per year for those 10 years one uh, half mile per year and then there would also lead some additional items for not just full reconstruction but uh, resurfacing and maintenance for other roads as well uh, and we do, every three years, we uh, re-audit the street conditions uh, under what's called PACER. It's P-A-S-A-R. Uh, and our, our maps on the PACER ratings are available on our website. But we have about, you know, it, it breaks out to about 30% of our roads are in good shape. Uh, most of them are in fair shape. And about, uh, and, you know, about a dozen or so are, are in what we call, you know, uh, poor shape. And so if we overlay where we've had water main issues with where we have uh, low PACER ratings, we have a, you know, a, at least a good 10 years worth of work ahead of us uh, on this project. The 10-year sunsetting on this would actually allow us to say, to look back after a decade on all the results that we put forth to the community and say, you know, we've got a proven track record now. We'd like your support for another 10 years. And then, as I said, hopefully that becomes a sustained funding model moving forward. Thank you. Other comments, Mayor Pro Tem? Uh, thank you. Just a, just a quick uh, framing of, of what I think we were just talking about. So um, unlike one of the other items, which we'll be discussing in a little while about the community center, where there's a very clear and specific proposal for a thing, what we're talking about here is, a, you know, instead of bonding, we're talking about a, a, a millage. And what that would do is provide a predictable flow of, of uh, funding so that we could then take on prioritized projects based on the needs of the infrastructure and things like that. So 
uh, and uh, with that would come some degree of uh, regular, you know, communication and oversight and, and planning of what the next project's going to be. So if you could just lightly touch on the approach that we would take to keep uh, council and, and our residents informed of progress with current initiatives and then like how we will continue to see what the next project is. If you could just set, shed a little bit of thoughts around mm -hmm. basically how would we know that during the course of the 10 years we could build up that strong track record that you just mentioned uh, a moment ago. Uh, we actually do this under our existing model with our capital improvements plan. So we plan five to six years out in advance at any time for, uh, as, we, as we look out and see the projects that are anticipated. So we would be able to be really specific with our capital improvements plan and say, you know, over the next five years, we're going to hit streets A through E. Um, and then every year when we accomplish one of those projects, that's fifth or sixth year, we're adding another one to that list as well. So residents could always look to see what we're doing, um, know exactly which streets are going to be addressed over the next five to six years and see for themselves, you know, am I one of those streets? Am I, is my issue coming up? Um, do I need to call staff's attention to some deficiencies on my road so I get added, uh, whether it's through maintenance, reconstruction, or uh, rehabilitation? So, uh, we, we thankfully we have an existing model in place for being very upfront and being very specific on the projects that we would like to to complete. Nice, thank you. And then as we as we gain additional insights and information about the status of our infrastructure, such as the uh, the sewer uh, you know study that's coming out in April. That will factor into those plans yes. and perhaps cause adjustments, right? Mm -hmm. we, yes. Mm -hmm. Something we thought we were going to do in 2022, we may need to defer to do this other thing instead or pull something forward. Correct. Again, based on uh, better information that comes along uh, sure. as a result of these kind of studies. Yes, sir. Uh, and as I said, we, we redo our road ratings every three years. Uh, so it gives us the ability to, to reassess our work plan based on what those road assessments come back. If uh, we find that a road is deteriorating faster than anticipated, we'll be able to address those and get that, uh, we begin the process of working towards uh, making it, you know, one of our projects, whether it's, you know, restoration, rehabilitation, or maintenance. Okay, and then, and then just, just finally, um, at least for the moment, uh, uh, what we would then be doing is, is uh, if this were to be approved by the voters, we would put uh, some of the funding in place and there'd be the governance mechanism, again, to ensure that there's clarity and what the, the rolling way plan is gonna be for both the roads and the sewers underneath. And then the degree of work that goes on to it, whether it's a full reconstruction or, like you said, some of the, the less uh, uh, in, you know, in invasive and, and overhaul kind of work that goes on with that stuff, too. So that's, it would be clearly communicated and, yes, and with regular reports and things like that mm -hmm. so we know exactly where the money's going. And then if any new information comes in, we could make appropriate decisions to, to move things around so that we best serve the residents. Yes. Uh, in fact, we would like we do now with um, the voter-approved funding from, I think it was, 2013 or, or 12, um, we would account for that in the budget document every single year. Here is exactly how we spent the monies uh, given to us, and so the residents can see for themselves where their money is going. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Blanchard. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, this two mills, if, if passed, would be subject to headly rollback, wouldn't right. it? So it would start immediately rolling its way down. Uh, Will we have enough in 10 years? I mean, I, I don't know how much that's going to affect us. It's going to cut back the, the amount of road we're going to be able to do at the end of the 10-year period. Right. Well, yes, sir. Um, that's something that we've been discussing and making sure that we plan around it appropriately. The Headley changes from year to year. It just depends on how much uh, value the mm -hmm. community as a whole gains uh, in its taxable value. Uh, but we would know that it, far enough in advance to plan around it, uh, and we would try to you know, forecast where our Headley hit's going to come from. Uh, one of the benefits, too, of going for at a 10-year intervals is um, if the voters like what we've done, we have the ability to go back and ask for t uh, two mills again and, again, work from the top and uh, back down then. from there. Yes, sir. And one other quick point. Uh, I don't know if you know about it, but uh, I believe it's House Bill 4814 that was just dropped into the hopper uh, is going to try and make us only uh, have millage elections in November. So that's something we need to be aware of. I don't think it'll get in enough traction to get passed, but... It's out there, and there are people trying to to slow down or confine us to where we can have millage elections. So we have to think about that also. Yes, sir. Uh, I know there the House Committee that's uh, have, has taken up that bill is holding its hearings on the 25th, and right. look forward to being represented well by the Michigan Municipal League at those. And call your representatives and tell them you don't want <laughs> it. Representative I already State did. Senator. Yeah, yeah. I did. Mm -hmm. You did. <coughs> Additional. Comments? So, 
the, the three items that we are discussing today, obviously they are all needs for the city. Uh, they're needs that have been identified by this council, prior council, uh, needs that the Citizens Advisory Committee was formed to discuss and study and to give recommendations. Um, they're important. Uh, the city uh, certainly would be better off with them, but our job um, is to discuss what is the priorities, um, what the residents ultimately want and, and would vote for because none of this is going to happen without resident uh, input. And we have to, I mean, all, all the comments obviously shown, have shown so far, you know, that, that our roads need work. There, there are significant um, sections of the city that, that could use new roads. And, and if you've driven down Harvard, um, and see, it's like, uh, well, I don't want to say that, but it's nice and smooth. We'll just <laughs> say that. Um, and, and it looks great. And it would be wonderful if all of the roads in the city could look like that. But again, that's one uh, eight month uh, project at a very serious expense. So uh, for purpose of the discussion continuing, um, we know that it is certainly important. Um, but is it a priority right now? Is it a priority to say we want to go to the voters in May? Or do we want to look at potential other times as the city manager mentioned, whether that is um, in August or in November? And because we have two other items that we're going to be discussing, I think we kind of need to take into account for our purposes here, just assume that there were three um, ballot initiatives that were going to be presented to the voters at some point this year. What would make the most sense for us? What would provide us enough time to properly engage the residents before making a decision? And what ultimately um, is going to allow us to have the voter turnout to actually hear what the voters actually want? So with that in mind, um, let's move past the roads for a minute and focus, uh, change our, shift our focus to um, the community center. Uh, initial thoughts, comments. We had a um, public meeting last week. I, it was well attended, uh, received a lot of feedback, um, some positive feedback, some questions or comments on, on how to improve things. Um, and there are still, as far as I'm concerned, uh, a number of questions that need to be answered before I am comfortable recommending uh, this to the ballot at this point, and hopefully we can have a discussion on some of those items tonight, maybe um, some input. If there are any residents that have input on any of these, you're certainly welcome to um, jump in here. Uh, but council, um, community center, thoughts, comments? Councilmember Hennon. Yeah, I likewise <coughs> don't think we have enough to move forward right now. There, um, I think there's too many unanswered questions. I think if we try for May, we're rush, going to rush. When you rush, you make mistakes, and these are would be a very expensive mistake to make. So I just think we need more resident involvement. I've been hearing from a lot of people, you know, with their questions, well, can we do more with less? You know, what trade-offs can we make? And I just don't think we're in a position to answer those questions for them yet and to make people comfortable. Okay. Council Member Kadeckel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I go along with both of you. Uh, I think st staff has done an excellent job in doing their due diligence thus far. And I'm comfortable that you guys will continue to do so. Uh, but there still are too many questions out there uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I want to make sure all the I's are dotted, all the T's are crossed. Uh, we define all the components and, and location and, and just, you know, we have to have the short, the medium, the long-term maintenance plan. We have to figure that out. Um, uh, the specific programming, you know, what, what, how are they going to relate to the different components that we're going to put in there? And the other question I have is, do we have a backup plan if it were to go? I, again, I'm not comfortable sending it to the ballot in May, but even if it were to go and fail, what type of backup plan do we have? Additional comments? Councilmember Blanchard. Thank you, Your Honor. 
Uh, I don't think it should go in May. I don't think it can be ready. I don't think any of these proposals can be ready in May uh, because we want to make sure that the citizens understand all the ramifications of what's going on with these things. And we need to put together a process to educate the citizens to get frequently asked questions, to get books of data that we can provide them. Uh, they're all necessary programs, I think, but I think we need to do it right uh, and we need to take a little more time. There, there are still questions. Uh, that can be answered, but like Dennis and Alan said, I don't think we should rush into this. We should, let's make sure we have it right. I would agree. I think it should be at least August. Okay. Mayor Pro Tem. I'll, I'll continue the, the, the theme here. I think um, there is a little bit of a difference between the roads and sewers we talked about before. That's ongoing stuff. We have a process we've described about how we might maintain and communicate that over the duration of that millage. Mm. This, however, I think we really do need that crisp, clear vision. We really mm -hmm. need to have folks that see themselves in this as a, as a beacon for our community and, and inviting guests and, and, and residents alike to, to celebrate this. Uh, I, uh, I also think that we have made great progress. The staff has done a terrific job listening to and incorporating feedback from residents, learning from prior um, initiatives where we've reached out and asked for uh, financial support for something, uh, and building you know, a, a good track record towards putting something together. I just think it needs more time to, to cook and get additional input and feedback from, from residents so that we can put the best possible proposal forward that would represent uh, Berkeley for decades to come. So I think, uh, I think the Community center is, I think it's needed. The question is what would it be? And, and there's some, there are plenty of uh, time yet to, to work through those questions. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if, if any council members have specific questions, we do have a representative here from Stantec. Just one more point. No, okay. Yeah, at the, at, at the risk of uh, being redundant, thank you, Your Honor, I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> at the risk of being redundant, yeah, I, I'm, I'm on the same page here. Uh, certainly, um, I think uh, Council Member Blanchard you know, hit the nail on the head. This certainly allows for uh, more time to have community discussion, uh, information sharing on the needs and, and how we move forward. Uh, and, and quite frankly, as we uh, kind of look forward in, into going about where this is maybe best place at, at what time during the year, uh, you know, if we look to uh, the end of the year in November, you know, we're allowing at that point the greatest number of residents to have their voices heard on the matter. So. Additional comments? Council Member Hendon? Yeah. Um, I would not entirely, I personally would not rule May out for roads only, for roads and sewage. Um, I think we know enough that we could get an education plan and ready for that. However, there's also, we have to pay for that election as opposed to mm -hmm. other times uh, it would, because there's a state election at the same time, we wouldn't have to pay. So I'm hesitant for that reason. Um, August, there is a likely going to be a school uh, bond or millage sinking fund, sinking fund. Sinking fund. and um, that could be a bad time as well. So now that pushes us back, but I'm also very hesitant to put two or three things in all at the same time. So that can become a big hit for people all at once. So. There are no good answers here. <laughs> um, you know, and to your point, if we you know, say, uh, as you mentioned, one in May and maybe one or two later, they're still going to hit in the same tax cycle initially anyway, whether you have three at one time, potentially, when they're yeah. going to hit. Sure. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, that just, was just, actually just something to clarify, at least. Am I correct? Uh, if I believe so, yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to add that. Um, I meant to ask that question, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it. Okay. Mr. Height. How's it going, Kurt Height, 3525 Robina? Um, although I think everybody would agree the roads do need to be addressed, and I really appreciate you bringing up um, as far as a way to monitor their progress. I would really love to see, and maybe it's just it's still being worked on, but I would love to see before we really say this is the amount we need or this amount we're voting on, maybe they can come out with a, if, if 12 roads or if 12% is the, the roads that need the most work, if we could say, come out with a model that says, these we see that right now, I mean, I know it could change, but at least right now, these are the roads we see need total reconstruction. These are the roads we see need a little bit of work. And, you know, these, these roads fall somewhere in the middle and come up, come up with some kind of a estimation of 
these are the time period when we see the, the work being done over the next 10 years so that even on the outset from the beginning we can look at say this is what we hope to achieve after the 10 years are up if this is approved so that when we get past the 10 years we can look back and say okay we, we looked at this this and this and we achieved either all of them which would be great and then you know going forward then we look at the next w you know worst roads I, mean, I would just like to see something like that right now it it sounds more like it's just an it sounds a little bit more like it's an open-ended plan where we recognize that there's roads that needs care but it's like we'll see what we can get to as the funding comes in and and I really would feel like Madison Heights did something where they they came up with a plan that was like R&B for you and me and they said over a 10-year period we're going to address these roads in these sections and they 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 repaired you know a section of roads in this subdivision this subdivision this subdivision and then the next year they cycled in and did you know other roads and at the end of 10 years now whole areas have all new subdivision with they, they totally tore them out put new sewers new water and while they had them open the, the utilities came in and put new gas lines and everything all you know up to the houses so it was like you know it was a you know it was a big project it took a lot of planning but yeah. they planned to have it done ahead of time so now when you look back you can say yes they delivered on mm -hmm. what they you know what they started out to do and, and you know now they're in a lot better shape so I would just like to you know I really appreciated when you said you wanted to come up with a way to monitor it as it goes along you know I, I would just like to see a roadmap of what they envision happening and, you know and, and cost wise mm -hmm. before it's even voted on as far as with the um, community center I mean I've, I've heard a lot of people talking uh, online on the social media you know they say while they do would you know a lot of people some people actually just love the plan that was presented and I, I admit it was really nice um, some had rec you know brought up points about as far as scaling as far as could they have done something smaller or would you know could is there a chance that we might see a plan for something smaller that kind of upgrades what we have you know whether it's a new building or whether it's the uh, existing building but upgrade what we have but not go to the extent of 15 million dollars rather more like five or seven million so it's kind of a more affordable um, I mean I would take that one step further and see have we ever looked at a plan I know uh, the the assessment said that it was like a hundred and hundred to one hundred fifty thousand in repairs that were needed for the current building have we ever thought about what if we were put a, not only one hundred and fifty thousand but let's say let's say it's five six hundred seven hundred thousand into not only repairing what's wrong with the building but renovating it extensively I mean I'm not sure how much maybe it's a million and a half but it, it renovating what we have there and you know updating it and, you know to see what we could come up with mm -hmm. I mean I think people would really respond to that as far as because they could see then you know give them give them some give a chance to get feedback on on those kind of options so because I, I really think you could get a lot of support for the moderate I just think that there's there's a lot of people that are scared away from that that top one because they haven't seen anything in, in the moderate range yet and the last thing and I'm sorry for taking up all your time is uh, you guys are going to talk about the City Hall in a moment and I think that was that to me that's a need I think uh, everybody can see that that's something that the city needs that this really area does need to be updated I would just love to hear a discussion about how um, I know there was like seven hundred thousand dollars that has to do with when the courthouse was moved to Royal Oak I would love to see how that is going to be applied to to offset some of the costs to uh, you know update the building thank you hey Kurt um, just to kind of quickly knock through though so there certainly would be uh, a plan in place for the roads and, uh, and the city manager alluded to that based on our PASER ratings we know where the roads are that need the most work and they're not all in the same area they're, they're in various places um, but so, so certainly we would have a target we would have a plan um, and we would also make sure that we are accountable to what we said we're going to do we can identify these are the roads now now things can certainly change mm -hmm. um, like we have seen in the past uh, roads can quickly deteriorate and they can uh, decrease in the PASER ratings and that would increase their priority for us to fix um, as far as the community center um, you know, you mentioned not seeing, you know, just, just seeing this as like this is the aggressive expensive model. Um, but the CAC looked at a number of other models that were more expensive that included pools and included ice arenas, um, and ice arena and a pool, I should say, uh, which were certainly more expensive. Um, and the CAC decided that those were not you know, in the best interest because of how large their scale was and how costly that they were. And that's how we came to uh, this option here 
certainly we, we need to be uh, as mindful of the residents' money and, and what's in the budget. Um, I do not personally believe that this uh, community center model is exorbitant. I, I, th I think we could certainly still have an ongoing discussion of what we want to see in that building and what we don't maybe need to see in that building. Um, but I don't think this is completely out of the realm of what a city uh, like Berkeley not only needs but deserves to provide the recreation opportunities for its residents. And I'm aware that we have a number of uh, wonderful businesses in the city um, that are able to provide some of those opportunities. Um, but we need to make sure uh, that we're looking out for all of our residents, whether they're kids, seniors, everybody in between, uh, making sure that they have um, a, a community center uh, that fits their needs. And that's something that I certainly uh, think we need to focus the discussion on and certainly engage more with the residents to see what they want, maybe don't want as much in there and prioritize, which is part of the reason why I think we just need more time uh, on that one. Mm -hmm. And as far as City Hall, yeah, again, it, it's, I agree, it's, it's, it's definitely a need. Um, it's just a matter of we have three very pressing needs right now, and how are we going to um, determine when we talk to the residents about those three needs and, and what's prioritized? Thank you. One quick uh, thought to kind of build on that, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, and those are all great points. Um, uh, as was mentioned, the plan around, you know, coming in position about what we would do with roads and sewers if that were to get funded and prioritized. We'd have a, a starting point and clear vision, strong communications to the affected neighbors and businesses and things and all that kind of good stuff. So I think that that would continue and with dedicated funding to it, it would certainly pick up steam. And, and I appreciate the pun of having a roadmap for our roads and sewers. I thought that was cool. <laughs> um, uh, and as far as the community center, I mean, these are big numbers we're talking about, right? And to see some of the other ones that the CAC had looked at with even bigger numbers, uh, those can be kind of daunting. So uh, as, a, as a body, we can't actually advocate for or against, but we can provide facts, right, and then let the residents. And so if and when something like the community center were to come up for consideration, we could certainly provide facts in terms of what it would be from an average homeowner, what would their annual expense would be. And that's a different kind of number, right? Mm -hmm. To see a number like that looks very different than 15 something million dollars. I mean, that sounds huge, but if you divide that up and all this and that, there's different ways to think about it. Uh, but uh, I like the essence of that point for sure, that uh, we need to make sure that what we do is finding that right balance, you know, to not be penny wise and pound foolish, but yet not go overboard and do something crazy. So. I think that's again where where the time would be needed to to make sure we have all the uh, the voices heard and the facts considered with this. And and as you, you bring up a good point, and you you come on, Please. come on, come, come <laughs> on up. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Just <laughs> wanted to, to close that. Uh, you bring up a good point, especially when it comes down to the cost per resident. I think that is certainly uh, something that is the utmost importance, and something that uh, folks want to know exactly what it would look like for each individual uh, resident. It's important. Um, that you don't just take a number that you see somewhere there that applies to somebody else because the numbers are very different. There's a lot of factors uh, that influence um, what your actual tax bill might look like. So I, I certainly uh, suggest, and I know I've seen um, at least one um, commenter online very faithfully uh, asking that residents find out for themselves and come in and actually talk to somebody. So I certainly thank her for that. Go ahead. Hi, um, Brandon Clements, uh, project manager from Stantec. Um, just supporting Matt and Teresa here. Uh, and I uh, thank you all for your, your comments earlier. Um, I just wanted to, to mention uh, one comment to you, which you're probably aware of, but um, not everyone is as involved in the architectural design process as an architect. Um, so I know I heard a couple of different uh, comments um, from the council regarding, you know, it could be a very expensive mistake. Um, may, maybe they haven't had the time mentioned um, having uh, some, you know, questions that were maybe unanswered. Um, and I just wanted to tell you all that the design process that we've gone through is, it's really about 12 to 15 percent of the full design process for the community center. So really the conceptual design we've done is to try to establish those big parts for the project what's the big program going to be, what are the major relationships of the building to the site, and that really, um, I'd encourage you if you have, you know, major uh, questions to get those to Matt, and, uh, you know, we're happy to work through, you know, some resolutions to those. That being said, 
if the project gets approved, there's a full a, a lot of other design phases uh, that will take time to develop more detail and, and solicit more feedback. Um, so just want to respectfully what add that, that comment. What does that typical timeline look like? Uh, so that uh, timeline, it can, it can vary depending on the project size, but typically there's, uh, you go from conceptual design to schematic design, design development, and then construction documents, which a contractor would build with. Uh, typically, each of those design phases, uh, schematic, design development, and construction documents can be between two and, and three months of design work. Uh, and that's involving, you know, getting focus groups together from the community and, you know, the Parks and Recreation Department to solicit input, really work on the details of the project. Uh, so when you add that all together, there's another, you know, six to eight months of really work with the community to kind of iron out all of the details to make a project that's a, a full building with uh, all the amenities that would be uh, commensurate to to the city. Okay, thank you. Um, so my only question worry is when I think the roads is the easiest sell for sure. But I think once you've added that there's going to be sewers involved with it, but then a study that's not going to be done until April, if you put it on the ballot for May, there's a lot of information that you don't know. So you're looking at one to two projects a year, but if you need to add a sewer component, how does that affect that? Do we know? No, we know, yes, we don't have the specifics, and that's one of the apprehensions here. Right, mm -hmm. so that would be my, my comment about putting it on in May. There's, I would hate for April to come and then go, oh, you know what, <laughs> we can only do one every five years. And then people are like, ooh, no, because that information came very last minute. And so. yeah. um, to that point, uh, the recommendations are going to be a, not a singular recommendation, but in fact a broad range of recommendations uh, from the large project to the small project. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it, the point is, is well made. Its specifics just won't be there until perhaps weeks before. And, and oh, yeah. sure. <laughs> and, and to what you were saying is, uh, is our frequent Dirk. It could be little money, or it could be it's somewhere in between. You know, we we have no idea right. what it's going to be till we see that study. Thanks. Yeah, I was just thinking, and and that is a good point that we need to be cognizant of because we're effectively through this with uh, some inclination, especially on the roadside and some hints on the sewer side, asking folks to commit to a funding level without the specifics at this, at this time. Um, at the same time, you know, kind of recognizing the, the need to move forward with infrastructure, we heard that very clearly last fall, uh, to, you know, to just wonder the, the ensuring that we find the right balance between having a, you know, the, the crisp specifics and waiting till the fall, um, mm -hmm. knowing that that builds in another six month delay before we could even begin to start something or is lining up the funding knowing that the specifics will come as we move forward and then we mm -hmm. can adjust as appropriate. This is just kind of the things that we need to balance and think about here. Understood. Charles Terrell from Berkeley. Uh, the Harvard project, was sewer addressed at all during the Harvard project? Uh, yes, sir. We actually uh, were able to address it in advance through uh, pipe lining. We did the cure in place pipe lining uh, prior, I think, a couple years prior to so, the. Uh, so it was not. It was that. not pulled out. Bigger pipe put in, increased capacity. No, not there was not a capacity project. We did do a drainage project where we added edge draining along the uh, the road beds so that not as much water sets uh, basically under the road surface itself, okay. uh, hopefully reducing frost heave. Okay. When uh, it, so when we it, strengthened when it. We added some uh, some drainage capacity, but uh, as far as adding capacity that was not already there, no, we did not uh, do that in that particular project. When it was opened up, were backflow valves installed at every uh, entrance into the sewer? Uh, we advocated for, for residents to do any kind of sewer work they wanted to, uh, they needed to do while, again, just, uh, just before we opened it up and then during uh, I'm not sure how many residents took advantage of that. Pro uh, so that, that, that was not part of the project. It was not part of the scope of our project. No, okay. those would be private and private. Okay. Uh, state legislature passed tax hikes on gas gas tax and vehicle registrations. Supposedly that was going back into the roads. How much of that is Berkeley going to see? Uh, we 
there's been not as much of an uptick for local road agencies as any of us would have liked to have seen. Uh, MDOT and the county roads, um, they received about, I think about 60% of that funding, whereas uh, local governments saw about 39% of it go to them. Uh, and then a lot of townships were added to the mix as well. So uh, the uptick, I, I, it was slight. And, and certainly uh, when you take decreases in uh, the state shared revenue program, uh, we're still not coming out ahead here. Well, I'm not talking about that. I know, that, I know. That's, but that's not targeted directly to roads, no, whereas the no, gas tax um, is supposed to be. No, and like I say, we, what we've seen, uh, even the slight uptake, really only handles maintenance issues. So it funds uh, purchases of salt, it funds the, the plowing, it funds um, the spray patch that we're able to utilize. Uh, what we, we classify as um, maintenance items, it doesn't certainly doesn't touch the reconstruction needs. Yeah. A broader question. I don't know if there's a, actually an answer tonight. When does a vote not be a vote? For example, we voted no on community center. Yet we're going back and looking at a community center now. I've been told that's, that's not settled. But the yes votes, for example, the operating millage, we're not gonna go back and have a revote on yes votes. We're not going to look at the operating millage. We're not going to revote on the zoo. We're not going to revote on the DIA. So why do we revote on community center? I think that's just absolutely wrong. Um, something that was voted down in 2009. Well, the zoo was voted in when? So you don't I, think I, we should vote on because it was voted down once in the past. Yes, and we're done. Forever. Just, just yes, just like we put an operating. Things don't ever change. Things change. But we, we voted in an operating millage that's not sunset. Hmm. So should that, should that come up for a revote because there was no sunset on that because things change? Okay. I mean, that's, that's my... Take your that's, point. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry, well, one quick note, uh, Kurt Hyde again. Um, I've heard it repeated twice that uh, shared revenue from the state for the roads has gone down, decreased. It actually, the last two years, I think it's actually increased 12% last year and six, four, four to 6% the year before. So I just wanted to make sure that we were clear that we were talking, you know, the, it actually hasn't decreased the last two years. It actually has gone back, started going back up. So hopefully that continues, but. It, and the, that's what I was, uh, the point I was trying to make with uh, Mr. Tyrell. Uh, in the grand scope of things, we've seen those funds are, are stagnant to a slight decrease. Um, Act 51 dollars have not kept pace with on the expenditure side so by not keeping pace with the cost of doing business in our sense they're actually moved backwards so we appreciate as you said and I hope it keeps going with the legislature but um, the local road agencies were not the the primary beneficiaries of the the oh, I thought legislation. it was for our budget it said the money yes. that you guys received were 12 percent higher I hope it goes up but again like I say it's not keeping pace with the needs and, and the other thing one quick thing on the community center one other thing that I forgot to mention was some people would ask maybe if they could look at the plan for the community center and look at that as like almost like a roadmap to say if there's some way they could phase it in and say you approve like a smaller design like a first floor and half the second floor or whatever and then eventually like maybe five years later if they can design it so they can add on the second floor with the gym or whatever i mean just something to so that you can start moving towards that vision because i'm telling you it looked great but uh, just in, if you could do it in a way where you can tackle it so that you can incorporate all the other things at one time, you know? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Matthews Penanen, uh, about 30 years here in Berkeley. Uh, I just wanted to offer a little historical perspective. I used to sit where you guys are, another fella here, and I think he may share some of the disappointment that I have in that we weren't able to get some of this stuff done. And my point is timing. The economy's been doing great for, what, about nine years. I hope it's going to keep going, but we have no guarantees. So you got to act now. The voters, I think, are more inclined to want to spend some more of their money now than they may be in five years or four years. And as we've all talked about, uh, all kinds of room for delay, things take time. So you've got an infrastructure that knows how to spend money for the roads. Let's get two mills going in May. A little more specificity on the community center, I think, is needed. But I think down the road, pretty soon we should move on that. 
I have a great sense myself that the pr plans that were proposed the other night are that middle. You know, there is no pool. There is no ice arena. We can't afford that. I think that's the reality of Berkeley. I think we can afford what was put forth. Not something less. Fifteen million dollars is a lot of money, but I think it was suggested the average homeowner may get hit for 87 cents a day, even if you factor that up a little bit higher for the higher priced homes. I think that's reasonable for what it can bring. Myself, my family has pretty much grown. The days of my kids being able to go over there are over with, but I, I plan on staying in Berkeley for quite a while to go. I'm willing to spend more money. I don't have one house in Berkeley. I have three houses in Berkeley. So I'd like to think, you know, there's a couple of people standing here with me saying the same things as far as spend my money. I know you guys will do it wisely. In my 30 plus years of being a Berkeley resident, I've realized the theme here is frugality. I've seen it always. We need to push that a little bit. You know, we're not Birmingham. We're not trying to be a Birmingham, but I'm tired of making do. Let's make it a little bit better. Times were bad. You know, my entire time on the council, Dale's time on the council is how we cut back. How do we cut back? I'm not saying throw open the purse right now, but now is the time to spend some money on some solid infrastructure, roads, sewers, community center. We deserve it, and I think we should spend the money to get it. Um, oh, really important, coordinating with the school, the timing of millage's request. They want money. We need money. It's unfortunate that it's the same tax dollars that can go for parallel things. I was talking with our recreation director the other night, and I hope the point will seriously be considered by the design team and by all of you folks and anybody else that the school's needs and the recreational needs of our residents are often parallel and side by side. Speaking of being side by side, when you look at the site of the building that I noticed, it's right up against the, uh, the stadium grounds. Hey, let's, let's face that reality and get as much as we can for our entire community out of that thing. How about a skybox? You know, <laughs> I know that might be extravagant, but for a little extra dollars, can we have some windows facing the stadium at a high level? Can we incorporate some funding from the schools, some cooperation from the schools? I know a lot of the activity that's taking place in our community center is school related. Kids that are done with school, where do they go? Let's keep that in mind. The site is so close. The property lines are right next to one another. I know there have been times in the past when our cooperation between the city and the school have not been great. I think they're good now. I think it's important for you, the mayor, to have a great relationship with the superintendent and on equal terms. I'm not saying roll over and say, well, we, what do you want? But you guys pay, we pay, and together we have a wonderful community center, a community in general that, uh, that, that appreciates a good school district and, and vice versa. Because we all know people pick communities to move in and to stay in based on the things we're talking about. They don't want their basements to flood. They want their schools great for their kids and they want a place that they can invite neighbors and friends to say, this is part of my community, this wonderful community center. So you got a lot of uh, work cut out for you and spend some money. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, former council member Matthews Pennon. Hi, my name's Mike Kirby, longtime resident here. I'm the chairman of the Parks and Rec Board here in Berkeley. I would have to agree with the former councilman there, and now is the time. The economy's going pretty well. I think the road thing is, you guys have done your due diligence and two mills appears to be where we're at. If we run into that big information that we get here on the sewer system in the next few months, we already have the two mills in line there, we'll act on it. If it's bigger than we thought, at least we're on our way, all right? If, if it's going to cost or perhaps we're going to do less road because we find more important things to happen, we're going to be doing them because those are more important things that need to be done. So either way, we're going to be spending that money. If we have to spend it on smaller amounts in that 10 years because we found we've had larger problems, we're knocking out those larger problems and in 10 years we'll have a little better ID when we do come back like uh, Mr. Baumgarten's talked about. I think that's a good idea to sunset that in 10 years. We go for our two mills now, see where we're at, get to recoup the two mills without the Headley situation in 10 years, and then see what we have done in those 10 years with the roadmap that we provided and what we've actually finished. So I think now is a great time to go for the roads. The rec center, I would agree with you guys as well. There's some stuff out there that really needs to be worked on. No, I'm not a big fan of the placement of the current uh, 
facility and some other issues but those are the things we work through when the individual from stan tech was up here and he was discussing how we work our way through the forming of our documents and all of our phases of this construction it would be safe to assume that all of those items he discussed take place after a yes vote we don't start forming up these these focus groups and start working on our other documentation until we've had a yes vote so we're not going to have all of these final components in place much like the road millage the day when we go to vote it's going to be ever changing even the rec center we're going to have an idea maybe where we put it a lot of the components in there a lot of the items that will be going on and the programs will be running the nuts and bolts of it however we won't pay for until after we vote yes to that and then the company starts to do its work that's really how that's going to work and it's going to be similar with the roads and even city hall here we have our great ideas and everything we want to do but at the end of the day it's going to work just like the gentleman talked about after we vote yes not a no vote that's when the hard work gets to be the pen gets to paper and we really see what's going on i do think that the that the city hall needs to be done as well that seems to be a small cost there when looking at it uh, from what was provided to us the other night on our individual SEVs for what we do need here. This is the face of our city, not only for our residents, but also for those that come here and visit us and those that come here to hope to do visit uh, business and those that come to move here. They come to our city hall and it's important that they see an, a great face and a good city by what we're presenting ourselves with here. So I think all those points are important. You guys got some tough decisions on your on your plate and uh, you know hopefully we make the best ones and and I believe the direction you guys have spoke to tonight really suits the best of us or most of us pretty well so thank you okay. thank you Mike <laughs> what? hello Marty Smith uh, Earl Mont. one question what does two mills represent a year for road construction I don't think I've heard that number yet just approximately about 1.2 million Okay, that doesn't go real far on road reconstruction, but that's fine. Okay, that's why I wanted to know. Mm -hmm. And and with with the, um, um, the community center, has there been any discussion about continuing operations, a millage for continuing operations? Is self-sufficient, or I don't know if that's been discussed yet, but uh, usually in projects like that, sometimes they are self-sufficient, rarely in communities, but other times there's a continuing millage for operations from year to year to year. Just wondering if that's been considered yet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marty. Former Mayor Pro Tem. Dale Good Courage, 2392 Columbia in Berkeley. I think I'd probably be remiss if I didn't mention what transpired and what went on nine years ago, which actually, tur actually turned into 11 years ago when we started the project. Before we got through all the uh, innuendos and the things that had to take place and all the committee meetings and the exhaust exhaustive work that went in by the park and rec center or parks and rec department and the parks and rec department itself or the the recreation board and the amount of um, surveys that went out there were several thousand people surveyed during that time and I think I to understand that the most current committee uh, voluntarily surveyed about 300 people and I'm guessing I'm close to that so several thousand nine years ago versus 300 residents uh, of current times uh, I find it hard and myself to understand that we build a 38,000 square foot facility for 15 million and we were building a 43,000 square foot facility with a swimming pool that was number one on the list of several thousand people and it may have been number one on the on the list of the 300 people most recently surveyed and I could be corrected if that needs to be done but in a nine year span of time the expense has gone up that much. I know that nine years ago it was very difficult. Times were tough, construction costs were lower because everybody was looking for work. I, I understand that. I'm hoping that we're gonna take uh, a little more time to do a little more due diligence and possibly still uh, purvey the committee to go out and visit other locations other than Huntington Woods. If we're using that as a comparison of what we wanna build then they haven't done their due diligence, nor have you. We visited several locations nine years ago to include the largest of facilities from Plymouth, Livonia, uh, Macomb, uh, uh, I was gonna call it Pheasant Run, but uh, Novi, Huntington Woods is an example. 
all of those facilities and spoke to most all of those builders from those locations. At the time that we did our survey and that we did our due diligence uh, as a council and uh, as a committee from Parks and Recreation, we uh, initiated uh, a public request and we selected to have uh, Pablo Roth and Clark do the work in the survey. I would entice you to take a look at what went on nine years ago and take a look at their drawings. No disregard to Stantec, they're our neighbors and they do an awesome job. They've done a beautiful job in my community, I'm close to them. They do an awesome job of keeping ca taking care of their property. I wish they were converting La Salette into a home for me, but they're not. <laughs> um, in no regard or disregard to any of them, I hope you'll take that into consideration because visiting one rec center to me does not tell me that due diligence has been done to decide what this community mean, needs. Um, I've looked at it, I was only there a brief period of time, but I would question the location of the facility. Um, if we were able to build 43,000 square feet and not impede on the 12 town drain, how can we not build a 38,000 square foot facility and have to move it so close to the stands, so close to the cell tower I don't know if Mike and some of the other uh, rec members and Teresa remember, but we have a circumference. Mm -hmm. we, lost, we lost state funding from the state because we got rid of some property and had yep. cell towers here and we lost it. So I think you, you certainly need to take a look at that and address that. W what about the distance where the senior citizens have to walk? Because from what I see, from where they're walking to get to the new facility, you better hire somebody to drive a golf cart to get them there. And what about the people who visit the baseball facility? Are you aware of how many families in this community participate in the baseball program? Mm -hmm. There are some 600 and some families between Berkeley and Huntington Woods that belong to the Dad's Club program, an additional 300 families for Mom's Club. They all participate in those facilities. How, do they, how does the high school get to the new, ba how does the high school get to the baseball facility with all of their equipment with the community center right up against them? How does the dad's club get their equipment to the equipment room? How do those coaches bring their equipment to the equipment room? How do we bring the tractors in to take care of the irrigation system for the number one community field that we share? How do we do all of those? Because I'm not an architect and I'm not a builder, but I don't see a way to get into those facilities that we've been at before. We now block off the, um, the, 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 the track around the football field. A lot of those things are questions that I would arise or bring up later on down the road. But mostly, I, I hope you'll take into consideration and take a look at it. If, if you don't have it and you can't find it, I'm pretty sure I have an office at home that still has it in there. There was an awful lot of work that went into it. And, and uh, I would hope that somebody can come back and tell me how, and maybe, maybe the gentleman from Stan Tech can answer that question. But 43,000 square feet, 38,000 for, and, w and I pushed it and uh, I made it pretty rough on the citizens by pushing for 15 million with operations in it. We had operations money in there. We had, uh, we had furnishings in that $15 million. We had money for other park areas in that money. I think the build out was only like nine to $10 million. That was nine years ago. And just one final point. If those 7,000 residents that were asked nine years ago, asked for a pool and a doggy park and all these other things that came into effect, and we lost some of those residents. I'm guessing that they have been taken over and that amount of people who have left have been taken over by much younger families. If you just judge it by the amount of baby buggies that get pushed up and down <laughs> this town and see the amount of young people that come in that want an active facility, um, I would ask you not to build a, a 38,000 square foot building that has a locker room and a gym, because that's what I see, and a track. So, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we need to um, see if there is some sort of consensus on when. Uh, we haven't spent much time um, talking about City Hall. Uh, it has been mentioned by a number of residents already and the need for that. Before uh, I ask for, um, preferred months to potentially ask for these. Does anybody have any additional comments regarding the City Hall 
uh, project. Questions on the timeline. Um, well, I'll go with City Hall. Um, <clears throat> I think it's necessary. I think we need to do it. I think it's our lowest priority. Um, I, I really want the staff to have a good place to live so we can attract good staff so we can keep them. But with the other two items, for me, it's the lowest priority of the three. Okay. Thank you. Additional comments? Councilmember Stedman? Um, I was on that committee that studied the City Hall along with Steve Baker, Alan Tadeco, um, Darshell Strickland Love, and Amy Vanson, and we visited many City Halls just to get an idea of, you know, what other cities were doing. People who had remodeled, people who had uh, started all over and built something new. Um, I think one of our, our, one of the things that we recommended was that we utilize the um, fire hall for the biggest meeting room, for the city council meeting room, and, um, and several other things, but also maintain this, except for this part right here, which used to be a carport, mm -hmm. and we would make that green space and um, something that, you know, could, you know, could have park benches and so on in it, um, and then renovate and remodel the inside of this building. Um, one of the things that we realized when we were looking that, at, at everything is that neglect is one of the biggest causes of deterioration in any building. And that's kind of how I look at our fire hall next door. I think it's really important that we, that we maintain it and that we renovate it and we make it um, uh, stay around here for many more years. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Yeah, to kind of build on that for just a second with the City Hall stuff. Indeed, those those field trips and visits were important to understand uh, that spectrum, and I think this, again, provides a reasonable balance between, you know, renovation and reconstruction and things like that uh, to activate the space that had been, uh, that is unable to be used right now because it's not accessible and all that kind of stuff. So uh, there is a key opportunity there. Again, this this facility is where our employees work, right? The folks that serve on behalf of the city. So giving them a comfortable place, <laughs> I agree the idea of giving them a, a nice environment where they can feel safe and productive and comfortable, not have to wear galoshes on certain days and have <laughs> six layers of clothes depending on uh, how it swings. Those kinds of things are, are difficult to, uh, to stay focused and, and bring their best energy every day. Uh, being able to provide additional services for the historical committee, some really exciting ideas as we engaged that committee. Uh, and working with the employees to see what they would like to do with the facility, I think, is, is, is uh, was good steps towards that. There was a comment earlier about the building fund, uh, that uh, money that has slowly been depleting. It used to be a larger number, and now it continues to decrease, as we do, uh, just as my colleague had suggested, investing that into keeping the heartbeat going, the pulse alive with this facility. Uh, so, um, you know, <coughs> at, uh, when, the, when the court first closed, there was a larger amount there that we had thought about rolling into a larger project to, to either use as, uh, as a match for a, a bigger grant or to kind of help, you know, seed some additional investments. That plan still would remain in effect, uh, but yet at the same time that a balance that uh, the, the building fund continues to decrease as we do the very things we need to do uh, to keep the place going to minimize, you know, the ongoing effects of, of age and just the fact that the fire hall was built in 1928 and things mm -hmm. like that. So that's, uh, that's getting up there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Councilmember Cadeco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Building on what my two colleagues said, and we were on that committee, and basically what Mr. Kirby said, the city hall is the face of the city. People drive by and they see a trailer, for lack of better words, okay? You go to other city halls and, and it, 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 it's a nice building. But it's not only from the outside, it's from the inside. When people walk in, we want them to feel comfortable. But our employees go walk in the finance room uh, f uh, where Mr. Pepperman is now, and uh, hopefully you haven't experienced it yet. But it will get wet in there. It does rain inside there. As far as priority, I think each one stands on their own merit. I think they're all important. And our city, we can't keep ignoring these things time after time after time because we're gonna be in the same position and it's gonna worsen over the years. Um, and 
and again, Mr. Peppermint, thank you for doing the uh, the printouts on uh, on last Tuesday, and uh, for all the residents that were there. I city hall would cost, and I'm going to say average between thirty five and forty dollars a year per person per household. A year, not a month. Thirty five to forty dollars a year, and to make our city look better or be in a better light. So when people walk by and say, wow, that's a nice city hall. I mean, that's what, when you come in from, when you're coming, you know, south down Coolidge and you see Berkeley City Hall, you don't see much. You see the gazebo and you see us in the back. We want something that's gonna attract people here. When they come in and they pay their water bills, it's a comfortable building that they go to. Or when they have to see Mr. Baumgarten or go in the finance department. So, and I want the employees in here to have a comfortable setting. I, I, I think they deserve more. I think our city deserves more and I think our neighbors deserve more. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, based on the comments that I've heard and the comments from the residents, uh, yes, I, I think Berkeley does deserve all of these projects. It just then becomes, well, the, the great thing about it is that the voters are ultimately going to decide these. So for us, we allow the voters the opportunity to study, um, to learn, to engage, and then ultimately they are going to make the decision. Um, what we need to decide, though, is when those questions will be brought to the residents. I've heard um, a couple of um, comments already regarding the roads and <coughs> potentially having it on the ballot in May. So just taking the roads right now um, and deciding if May is the right time or if another, uh, if one of the other two alternatives makes more sense. I have a question that would feed into that. So the timing, if we did a millage for the roads in May or August, or November, when does that hit tax bills? When will people see that? Is it different time? Is it the same time? Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't matter. Um, if all three receive voter approval, obviously they would all appear on the same bill uh, at some point. Uh, the way that the uh, proposed language in front of you reads would be uh, 2019. So it would be either the summer bill or the, um, the winter bill for 2019. Uh, if voters approve uh, similar f uh, wording um, whenever whenever they do so for each of those, we able, we're able to set when that first gets assessed. Um, realistically, we would be looking at setting them for uh, 2019 as well. So either uh, the discretion that we have is whether that um, comes on to the summer or the winter bill, but uh, residents could see them both uh, uh, reflected in the tax bill in 2019. Then I see, I see no rush for May with that in mind. Um, we can take the time to do a better job, do our due diligence, answer the outstanding questions people have about the sewers, wait until we get that information. Um, and because I would like if we could spread it out more, but I also don't want to wait too long. There's a lot of risks waiting too long. So my my inclination right now is all three in November. Councilmember Gavin? Um, I actually uh, happen to agree with that as well, all three being in, in, uh, on the ballot in November. Um, again, I think it, it gives a little bit more time. I think it, it, the information gathering side of it, especially on the roads, is certainly very far along. I, um, I, I don't disagree with that. I think the, the opportunity to get the study back is um, – uh, is going to be very beneficial, uh, I think, in terms of that information sharing uh, side of it. Uh, the one, so I am also in favor of, of doing all three uh, in November. Uh, the one question I do have, and if that's that's all right, um, is to, uh, and it, it certainly doesn't have to be answered tonight or anything like that. Just something that we kind of want to consider. I'd like to know a little bit more about going forward. Is the uh, the implication of the new tax bill uh, or tax law that was just enacted? Um, you know, the elimination of federal tax exemption uh, on bonds, uh, you know, whether you know, kind of taking that into account and in terms of the cost of borrowing. Um, 
and and more specifically, and the city may not even do this side of it, the uh, the advanced refunding bonds uh, potentially being taken away under the new law. So uh, just something to maybe I can we can the whole council can get a little bit uh, further information on a little bit in depth uh, as as we kind of go forward. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Cadeckel. It's funny I. Uh I kept thinking I wanted to see the road millage go now, and I thought we'd be ready. Um, but based on what I'm hearing tonight, uh, especially with the sewer report coming in in April, um, that could complicate things. Uh, we really do need the roads. I, I. <laughs> right now, I, I, I'll be honest. I um, I'm torn between putting the roads on May and uh, and the other two on in November. Um, but if it's uh, if it'll make the people feel comfortable and we can do our due diligence and educate them more and more uh, per project, then I would go along with all three in November. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, uh, the uh, the city hall and the community center, I think November makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of conversation and energy that needs to get built around that, along with some degree of clarity into the overall vision, recognizing that the process uh, would would ensue following a yes vote to get into the details. As far as the decision on on, lev on levying the roads and sewers, uh, the proposal says 2019, uh, but is that, it's just a piece of paper, but I mean, is that set in stone? What, if we did choose to go in May, could we not, pop that in the summer taxes of this year and begin that process meaning and that's just what's written here but is it something procedurally preventing us from taking action sooner rather than later on the roads and sewers uh, or waiting until because if it's if there is like no technical procedural way for us to begin to receive the funds and things until 2019 then I agree I don't think we need to rush this thing let's get it right uh, the sewer uh, study I think could have us maybe decide whether it's two and a half mils instead of two or something so I see mm -hmm. that for sure so we'd be taking some some bit of um, educated um, uh, insight here based on what the CAC did with with this remember they reviewed this one as well um, so I guess my technical question is is there something preventing us from considering it as a 2018, of course, it'd be pretty quick, right? Because mm -hmm. May, and then all mm -hmm. of a sudden, hey, it's summertime. Uh, but if there's a procedural issue stopping us, then I don't see why to rush for a decision in May when we can't begin to take action on it until the following calendar year. So, do we have any guidance on that, or is that, um, is that something that could that could be explored? I know we did discuss it. You, um, John, can I come up? Uh, I know we did discuss it. Um, tax bills are due to the county. Um, I think in the middle or to the end of May. Would we be able to work that fast? It would be very tight. Okay. That would, that would be my uh, only concern is that we'd be tight to doing that. It is a possibility, though. It is a possibility, yes. Um, I we, we've been known to do some <coughs> wonderful things. <so. laughs> Especially if the will of the voter says, hey, we need to take care of infrastructure, roads and sewers. We're just yeah. going to be getting into the spring and summer mm -hmm. months when rain is going to start to happen again. And, and uh, you know. I just hate to, to say, oh, we're waiting, we're waiting when there's an opportunity. You know, it's certainly, you know, we have good folks that do incredible things, and yeah. and if there's a way we could uh, see our way clear to, to begin to take action and on our infrastructure now, mm -hmm. I'd really like to see us, uh, you know, okay. find some uh, mountains to move. Um, Madam City Attorney, do you, are you aware of any restrictions we might have uh, while adjusting the language? Um. I'm not aware of any restrictions um, at the moment, but as um, finance director indicated, it, it it will be tight. It's admittedly tight, um, and I, I think that that needs to be taken into consideration by the board. Um, and, and I I don't know if it's doable um, mm -hmm. with that time, you know, sure. with a May and having to get it to the county by May. Mm -hmm. So. Keep that in mind. Sure, thank you. I, I will note, I'm not sure if it's the points been made. Um, the reason we're discussing this this evening, is, um, the county has a requirement of the 30th of this month to get that language to them. Um, so I may, while it feels like a long way away, the, the deadline for enacting legislation by this body in order to have a special election in May, um, the deadline for us is tonight. 
So that's that's why we we're discussing this this evening. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Council Member Stedman. Um, I think the the community center and city hall should be November. Um, I'm still a little bit torn about um, the roads. Uh, how much does a special election cost between uh, eight and nine thousand? Um, at least eleven thousand. Eleven thousand. No. Yes. And if we passed it in May, we could start right away. It's tight. Yeah. Um, there, there. Like I said, there, there's some apprehension there. But um, if it, if it's just a matter of um, well, again, like, as you heard from finance and as you heard from legal, it, it's a very, very tight timeline to turn it around from a May vote to a summer tax bill. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those come out or those are due um, pretty quick after that. Right. Um, and that's, that's the issue is there is some concern that the deadline for submitting that language to the uh, treasurer's office would be before we get the... Um, the approved results back from the county. So while we have a pretty good idea, you know, as of election night, what happens, there's a certification process that needs to take place after that election. Mm -hmm. And so to have a certified election results from the Board of Canvassers coming back prior to us having to submit that to the county, that's where our apprehension comes in as far as the timeline goes. I think I would go with August or November. For roads? Councilmember Blanchard. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm very apprehensive about a May election because not for the turnaround that they're talking about. I think that that is tight and that's critical. But we need to get the word out to our people. Uh, we need to have a lot of meetings with the people and we need to sell this because uh, it's critical. And I don't think we can get all of that done uh, for a May election. I want to really make sure that that we get the word out so we're fairly certain that we're going to have an infrastructure that we can work on that's going to get passed. And to do that, we need to educate an awful lot of people. And that's going to take time. So my recommendation would be the roads in August and the other two in November. Okay. Um, so just a quick tally. It seems like uh, the majority is certainly... Uh, in November for the, the City Hall and for the Community Center. That seemed like November, and it will give us ample time to do all the due diligence that we need to do, um, including studying our options, looking at our options, and engaging much more with the community uh, in that time frame. And, you know, November election, hopefully we'll have a higher number of residents that will be able to turn out to, to give their uh, opinion on that. That leaves us with the roads. Um, a couple folks were on the fence uh, regarding May or November. Um, the majority-ish was November. Uh, there's kind of some ambiguity there. Um, so the other two were set aside. I think we're, we're looking November for those two, for City Hall and for the Community Center. Um, we need to figure out roads. So I'm going to go around one more time. And I can't have anybody on the fence here. <laughs> <laughs> because here's the deal. If we are going to do it in May, as the city manager said, we have to have this ballot language by the 30th, January 30th. Secret, so I don't want to rush ballot. that through uh, in terms of, you know, trying to run it through. But we do have, you know, the, the roads is the one that's furthest along. We have the most infrastructure in place if we do decide to ask the residents in May. Um, so this is what you were all elected to make decisions on. So unfortunately, I'm going to hold all of us to making a decision. That includes me. Here we are. Uh, so we're going to start at the other end this time. Give you guys a second. <laughs> May no. or not? No. Thank secret, you. Secret ballot. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Sedman. No. Okay. Yes. Councilmember Kadeko. I'm going to go yes with May. Councilmember Hennan. No. Councilmember Gavin. No. Do we get to vote on August? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was a yes, but it's a four to three. I was uh, prepared to 
um, move forward with infrastructure because I do think it's critical uh, that we are able to make improvements not only to the road, but to the, you know, whatever sewer infrastructure we can um, get at. And I know that we're going to have the capacity study coming back in April, and I realize that that does not give us a lot of time. Uh, but like has been mentioned a few times, um, having projects that are ready and projects that are really critical to us, we, we have a pretty good understanding of what we need to do. Um, the capacity study could shift the focus a little bit, but none of that matters, so I'm not sure why I even just uh, waste my time telling you that <laughs> since the decision was made. Uh, council has decided that all three um, will be pushed back. Um, just for the sake of clarity, uh, Councilmember Stedman, if you would prefer an August election for the roads, we'll go through that too. Okay. I'm open to it pending more information. <laughs> oh, <laughs> offense. <laughs> okay. You done writing that? Uh, no in August. Okay. Uh, no in August since we couldn't assess it until the following year anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes in August. Okay. Yes. The reason I say that, I think three on one ballot will be excessive, and I prefer two <coughs> on that on one ballot. We have a better chance of getting them passed. I think we have three. Uh, people are just going to say, I can't vote for all these, and some of them are going to go down. Yes, I would agree with you. Uh, however, um, I am a no on August. Uh, if we are going to be Moving um, and having items on the ballot in November, um, I don't see why, if they're not going to be assessed at the same time, why we want to rush to have one in August. We're going to have the turnout. I think this is going to drive even more turnout. And at the end of the day, um, if there's enough information and there is enough engagement and the residents do see a pretty clear need, uh, they will come out and they will vote for them. And, and if the case is not made or the needs have not been thoroughly expressed, due diligence has not been made, the residents will certainly let the city know that as well. We will be moving forward in November with all three ballot initiatives. Uh, stay tuned. More information to come on all of that as we have given ourselves a, a little bit of a window. I assume that is enough direction for you. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. The deadline for um, getting a local proposal on the November ballot is would for us be July 16th, and we have to go to the county by July 31st. So July 16th. Yes, sir. Thank you. Th uh, thanks. I think we're keep Sorry, I think we're finger kind of going each other. Okay. I was just going to say I'd rather not wait until that last sure. Sure. meeting. Certainly I'd like not. to keep this momentum going. I think uh, <laughs> this conversation tonight was fantastic. I was so happy to hear the input from folks both tonight at the um, town hall last week. I'd like to continue this inertia so that we can even in you know, June have really good clarity on what we're doing and, and so we can you know, coast from the paperwork side and lean in from the community side. I think it's pretty clear from the discussion today and, and from what we've heard from the residents here and uh, residents and, and various other through various other media um, that this is the way we're going to proceed so there is no reason to delay it we certainly need to um, make sure that we have a plan in place to do whatever due diligence we need to do for all of these projects and have them all ready to go uh, and approved and you know the sooner that we can take care of that certainly the sooner it'll be for uh, staff working on it, the various boards and commissions that are associated with it, the residents who want to get in and help out and educate, um, it'll certainly put us in a much better spot. Indeed. Councilmember Hennon? Yeah, and I had some of the similar ideas. Something I'd like to see is, you know, milestones so that we have, you know, what the education plan will be, what the uh, community input, you know, what steps we're going to be taking to gather that input, and, uh, you know, milestones so we know if we're on track for achieving all our goals to have this ready by November. Okay, thank you all for that discussion. I will now close the discussion. Do I need a vote to close discussion or can we just move on to agenda item number eight? Ready to move on. Yeah. Okay, Ms. Boucher, please read item number eight on tonight's agenda. Resolution number R0418, matter of authorizing the amendment of the 2017-2018 operating budget, those operating funds as presented. Is there a motion to approve R0418? Motion to approve. Support. Moved by Council Member Blanchard with support from Council Member Cadeco. Mr. Baumgarten. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll actually defer to uh, our Acting Finance Director, Mr. John Pepperman, on this particular item. Are there any questions uh, regarding the items being presented? Mostly it's just a move of funds from one fund to another fund, particularly to accommodate the generator over at the Public Safety Building and the additional um, requirements that were discovered as they went along through that process. So that's why they're t we're taking some of that money. Uh, the or I think there was an original budgetary uh, amendment approved of about, six, I want to say 63, and it's now up to 80 some odd. And I'm doing this from memory. I'm sorry if my memory's You're right. poor. <coughs> so um, that that's the one. Um, so that, that particular item reflects the, an action the council took at a previous meeting in order to authorize the purchase of a generator. So this now, um, since the decision was made by the local governing body, um, this now appropriately aligns the, the budget with the action. I may make a comment, Your Honor. These funds are all internal to the Public Safety Department. Yes. They're, they're nothing from, we're not taking from any other department, we're just re reallocating funds into the Public Safety Department to, to cover this uh, new generator, which will give us better capacity in case of a power failure and we'll be able to run all of our equipment over there. Absolutely, sir. That is correct. Are there any other um, amendments aside from the generator? Uh, there's one reflecting the action taken by the DDA board as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it appropriately adds, um, uh, appropriately funds the Coolidge crosswalks, which went in uh, back in December. Um, again, that was a board action. Uh, the board does have uh, some oversight over their budget, but ultimately the city council itself uh, has the final say in the DDA board's budget. So uh, this would be uh, reflecting the, that action from them. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments from council? Or the finance director or the city manager? Seeing none, Ms. Boucher, would you please call the roll? Blanchard? Yes. Gavin? Yes. Hennon? Yes. Podesta? Yes. Stedman? Yes. Baker? Yes. Turbine? Yes. We have now reached the uh, communications portion of our evening. Uh, up first, I believe, is our newest council member who will be hazed. <laughs> <laughs> you get to go first, Council Member Gavin. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, first off, uh, to the city manager, the city staff, uh, I thought the town hall was fantastic. Um, I thought it was really well put together. Uh, I liked the, the breakout stations. Um, and uh, thank you to all the residents who showed up uh, to give input. Um, so I just, on that front of it, I thought it was really well put together and really well executed. Uh, on uh, kind of a more personal side of things, I just want to thank uh, my feather, fellow council members uh, for the, you know, the faith that you've placed in me to serve the residents of Berkeley. Um, I'm very humbled and, and honored uh, by the opportunity. Uh, and in, in to <laughs> for um, council member Baker, I know he likes the pun. So uh, t talking about roads tonight, you know, local government is where the rubber meets the road. Uh, and so having that chance to be able to, to give back to the community in a positive way, I, uh, I greatly appreciate it. And um, so I just want to say thank you to, to you all. I want to say thank you to the residents. And I look forward to, to serving you in, a, in an honest and thoughtful and thorough way. Thank you. Councilmember Hennon. All right. Um, just found out recently about my liaison position, so nothing to report there yet. Um, I know the information packets for City Council Planning Commission have started going online ahead of the meetings, and so I know a lot of people appreciate that. Uh, I do as well. And I've also been talking with a lot of staff, uh, giving them ideas and you know, talking over ideas for better communication from the city. And while there's always room for improvement, I'm definitely seeing progress and I really appreciate uh, staff you know, listening to my ideas and uh, working with us on that. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Kadekel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, again, I wanna thank Becky and Ruth from Nip and Tuck and she was respectively because they are gonna be missed, uh, not just their restaurants, their food, but they themselves. Um, I want to echo what Council Member Gavlin said. Um, <laughs> Ross Gavin said. That's his name. It's a mesh. <laughs> uh, I want to echo, I want to thank everyone that came out on Tuesday. Uh, I think it was uh, a brilliant idea to have Mr. Pepperman there um, helping people figure out what their bills were going to be. Um, and it, it was a great turnout, and I'd like to see many, many more of these types of meetings. Uh, 
So before November, there's not even a question as to which way we're going. Uh, from the Parks and Rec Department, um, they had the Daddy Daughter Dance. Uh, it was very successful. They sold out uh, all three sessions. There was a waiting list. Some people couldn't even make it. Um, uh, but I want to thank the Berkeley Junior Women's Club, the Berkeley Huntington Woods Youth Assistants, and the Parks and Recreation staff for the great work they did. Uh, this Saturday will be the Mother Son Sports Dance. That's Saturday, January 27th. You can still get tickets for the 4.30, 6 o'clock, and 7.30 uh, sessions. Tickets are still available at $7 per couple, $3 uh, additional siblings. Uh, ticket prices will go up on Wednesday to $10 per couple and $5 additional siblings. So act now. Uh, Winterfest, uh, a great event. Uh, the Parks and Rec um, Department puts on a great, great event every year, Summerfest and of course Winterfest. Uh, we are going to uh, have that on February 3rd from noon to 3 o'clock. Uh, join us for a variety of activities, including face painting, cooking, cookie decorating, cake walk, ice sculptures, more, and maybe even the mayor's kids throwing snowballs at them. At him, um, something we we saw two staples in Berkeley leave. We see Dow Hospital leaving, and something that's really bothering me. I was speaking to another. Uh, retailer in Berkeley, a mom-pop type store, and told me they're about to leave, uh, that this may be their last year. And I've even brought this up at the Michigan Municipal League uh, to some of the people there. The concern is the future of our retail and the, and the retail apocalypse. Uh, right now we have so many people ordering through the internet and being delivered by UPS and FedEx, and these these people that are our people. I mean, we don't want to be all restaurants and bars. We want to keep our retail people here. We want to see more street traffic if possible. Um, and, and it concerns me. The, according to Carlisle Wartman Associates out of Ann Arbor, uh, the retailers predict a net loss of 3,800 stores across the country by the end of the year which is very, very alarming, mm -hmm. and that's billions of dollars. There's a lot of retailers that are, and well-regarded chains that are billions of dollars in debt right now uh, because the people are not coming to their stores. And between the mom pas and the malls, uh, I, I'm very concerned about the future of retail, and I hope everyone supports the Berkeley retailers. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, kind of uh, building on that uh, from a DDA perspective, obviously our downtown uh, depends on a diverse, vibrant uh, offerings of entertainment and, and shopping and community gathering. And so uh, I too would like to see you know continued uh, energy and vitality with all, <coughs> with all of our businesses. Uh, we do have see opportunities here with Sela's Nip and Tuck, um, the Hadal Hospital, Toy Soldier Shop, and others uh, to continue that trend and work hard to bring the kinds of things to our community. Uh, both from a diversity perspective and also from an engaging, you know, products and services that we as a community want to support. Uh, we see that opportunity ahead of us. So I think uh, it is a daunting task in some some uh, respects. I'd encourage folks that uh, that take advantage of those Berkeley bucks and things through the chamber and others to, to use those things, right? Support our businesses uh, and keep, uh, keep good things going. Uh, on the DDA theme, uh, Downtown Development Authority offers a couple of additional uh, insights and things to look forward to. Uh, the design guidelines, which are a set of uh, policies and procedures around which we can uh, uh, shape the look and feel and vibe of our downtown. Those design guidelines, uh, we uh, have a series of input sessions where folks can see those and add comments and see their voices and uh, ideas manifested in these design guidelines. Next one's coming up. You've got a little bit of time to plan for it. It's not till Wednesday, March 7th. Uh, from 6.30 to 8.30 in the community center. But I want to start getting the word out now so folks can think about it. Uh, the current materials are available through uh, through the city if you want to see what's there so far and, and think about it. Uh, I wanted to get that out there Wednesday, March 7th. Uh, the DDA is beginning the process of applying to Main Street, Oakland County, uh, which is a program, uh, surprisingly, through Oakland County. 
uh, to become a select Main Street program. That opens us up to certain kinds of grants and opportunities to do things uh, that that designation uh, provides for us. Uh, and to the notion of, of retail, uh, the DDA is bringing in a nationally known retail consultant who's going to do three different workshops uh, over three days on subjects relevant to small independent business owners, uh, as well as offering one-on-one -on -one consultations uh, with our business uh, folks. So uh, the DDA is trying to help uh, provide the tools uh, that our, that our uh, local uh, businesses uh, need and can benefit from. Uh, and finally, the D it's one of those things, the DDA has a facade grant program. So the outside of your storefront, uh, the, the DDA has a program to match up to $2,000 investment in, in the storefronts. Uh, so we encourage folks that are interested in taking advantage of that to, to do so. It's a pretty easy process to apply uh, and help um, add a little bit of uh, rejuvenation to, uh, to your front appearance there. Um, I want to thank our historical committee for their tr uh, tremendous work uh, across the board and, in, and specifically with uh, the outreach and proactive work that you guys have done with, the, uh, with Nip and Tuck and with Silas and then uh, Dahl Hospital down the road here too. It's, it's great. I encourage everybody to, uh, to check out those things, uh, share your memories uh, and stories with the committee so that we can uh, capture those uh, as part of our city's uh, evolving history here. Uh, and then I'll finally, I'll just close with uh, Theodore Roosevelt. You guys might have heard of him too, Teddy. Oh, has said, in any moment of decision, uh, the best thing you can do is the right thing, the next best thing you can do is the wrong thing, and the worst thing you can do is nothing. Again, the best thing you can do is the right thing, the next best thing is the wrong thing, and the worst you can do is nothing. I think what we've talked about here tonight uh, and continuing the conversation of making these key decisions is heading us down the right path. Uh, we uh, have a lot of important decisions as a community coming up through the things we've talked about earlier today. Uh, and I'm uh, looking forward to us doing hopefully the right thing uh, in the very near future, uh, both leading up to the, the summer months when uh, the decisions uh, around language might be uh, finalized and then, of course, heading into the fall. So uh, adventures to come, and hopefully we'll do Teddy proud. <laughs> Thank you. Councilmember Stedman. Um, okay, in terms of the library, I'm just going to ask you to look to see what else is available f for the rest of this month in January. Um, uh, check on the website. There are many programs. Um, if you see something you're interested in and it requires a registration, register early because they really pack them in, in all of those programs. Um, the Beautification Committee is going to have a fundraiser, and I'm not sure of the date yet. Um, it's soon at Patrick Day's. Uh, Patrick Jays, so um, I'll keep you posted on that. And um, welcome aboard, Council Member Gavin. Thank you. <laughs> gravel in. It's February 27th. February 27th? Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Five to nine. All right. Okay, fe February 27th from 5 until 9. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Sure. Um, the other thing is um, I just wanted to say I thought that meeting that we had um, uh, at the community center was really nice and really well attended. And I hope that all the meetings that we have in the future for all of these issues are as well attended as that one was. So that's. Thank you. Councilmember Blanchard. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to talk about recycling for a minute. Uh, on the average, Soccer, who we recycled through, receives 13,000 tons of paper, plastic, metal, glass recyclables collected at the curb each year. Soccer accepts newspapers, magazines, office paper, junk mail, box board, cardboard, drink boxes, milk cartons, and all plastic containers, metal cans, glass bottles, jars, and more at the curb. Soccer member communities earn a rebate on every ton of recyclables collected. Every piece of paper, bottle, or can uh, set in a recycling card is, is cash for the community. Uh, for the member communities, recycling avoids disposal costs and provides revenue sharing on the sale of recyclables once they are sorted and processed by SACRA. Participating in our community's recycling program will help us offset costs to operate the recycling and trash collection services. Comparing the four-month period September to December 2016 with the same period 2017, which is after everyone received the new recycle bins, we find that the tonnage of recycling in Berkeley has gone up 41%. So that's amazing. <coughs> so we've done a great job. Keep up, you know. oh, I just want to say, keep up the great, great work, and we're keeping things out of the landfill, and we're saving the city money, and everything is good. So appreciate that. 
On the Chamber of Commerce side, the Chamber is having a scavenger hunt to get people out to the businesses. Now, if you are, uh, I can talk about one thing that's involved in that is the library is involved in this. And if any of you have kids that are third, fourth, fifth grade, maybe sixth grade, or grandkids, the library's thing that they're giving away in the scavenger hunt are American Chiller's trading cards. Now, American Chiller's are books written by Jonathan Rand that they're scary books for kids and they're very popular. The last time I talked to him, he said they'd sold over seven million books. So he started with trading cards. So that's what the library's giving away. So if you go on a scavenger hunt and you got kids, you could get trading cards and give it to the kids because they, they like them. He's, he's writing a book about every state that's, that's scary. He's wrote, written 15 or 16 books about Michigan cities. Uh, he's got a series of books for younger kids called Freddie Van Orten or Fearless First Grader. Uh, <laughs> so it's all kinds of things for kids. And so I, I conned him into donating these training cards to the library so they could give them away. So it's a win for everybody, I think. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you for the excellent con work. <laughs> City Manager. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity. I want to go ahead and announced publicly that on the February 15th, I'm gonna have chat with Matts. That's plural. Uh, we'll be having our public safety, uh, will be our feature department. So Chief Matt Kane will be joining us. So um, this is a month where it'll be plural. Um, but that's one of the, I'm excited to have that co community conversation. I really enjoyed what we did here tonight, having this conversation out loud. Uh, and I wanna reflect the thank yous uh, that the city council put forth for all those that attended our last open house. Um, we get farther with dialogue than we do with anything else. And I'm excited about where we're going with this and I'm excited about uh, what we've managed to accomplish uh, just in a short time. And I appreciate the accolades to, to staff. They, they deserve it time and time again. The, what, what Teresa and her department has done, what Derek and his department has done, uh, what our finance department has done, it is just amazing work. And um, across the board, our employees deserve quite a few accolades. And it's refreshing to see that come from, from city council. So thank you to all of you as well. Thank you. Madam Attorney. I have nothing this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple quick items. I do want to thank again uh, Ruth and Becky for all of the years that, uh, you know, they, they poured into serving our community, serving the residents of Berkeley. Uh, they will certainly be missed. But uh, as Mayor Pro Tem mentioned, there are opportunities for new businesses now to come in and, and leave their mark uh, on Berkeley in, in the future as well and, and take up those, uh, those spaces. So I look forward to that. Uh, the same with the Dow Hospital. Um, certainly will be something coming at a future council meeting, um, recognizing them as well. Uh, it is unfortunate uh, that all of these have you know, taken in the last few months uh, just after the November election, <laughs> I have had to assure numerous folks that it was not my fault um, <laughs> that all these historic places are leaving the city, and they claim it's not, so I'm going to stick with that for now. Um, I was going to um, spend a minute talking about resolutions, since this is the first uh, meeting that we have had in, in the New Year official meeting, um, at least. Uh, I hope those resolutions are going well, but realizing that we're already this late in, um, statistically most of those resolutions will already have gone by the wayside. Uh, hopefully that is not the case with yours. And on a final note, as Councilmember Hennon mentioned, he had just received his uh, liaison appointment with Councilmember Gavin, um, fully appointed. I am going to read off all of the liaison appointments moving forward for the council members and the boards that they will serve. Uh, beginning with the Beautification Committee, as we heard, that will be Council Member Stedman, the DDA, Mayor Pro Tem Baker, the Environmental Advisory Committee, Council Member Hennon, Historical Committee, Mayor Pro Tem Baker, Library, Council Member Stedman, Parks and Rec, Council Member Cadeckel, Planning Commission, Council Member Gavin, Tree Board, Council Member Hennon, ZBA, Council Member Cadeckel, Continuing with the Chamber, Council Member Blanchard, and serving on the Coolidge Committee uh, will be Council Members Blanchard and Gavin. So those are the liaison appointments, uh, at least for 2018. 
And with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Move to adjourn by Council Member Cadeco. Support. With support from Council Member Hennen. Ms. Boucher, would you please call the roll? Gavin? Yes. Hennen? Yes. Cadeco? Yes. Stedman? Yes. Baker? Yes. Blanchard? Yes. And Terbrock? Yes. The January 22nd meeting of the 37th Council has been adjourned. <laughs>